The keynote speaker for the evening was Richir Sharma, head of Emerging Markets and Global Macro Morgan Stanley Investment Management and author of the international bestseller Breakout Nations in search of the next economic miracles. What I find though, I mean like really interesting when I look back at these 20 years is that how 20 years ago no one was really that interested in what was happening in the rest of the world back here in India. And since then, it's fascinating to see how things have moved. There is no other economy and no other stock market in the world which is as linked to global trends as India. And this I find to be absolutely fascinating. So if you look at the Indian stock market for one, uh, the correlation of the Indian stock market to the other emerging markets is the highest of any emerging market in the world. If I were to show you those two graphs of India versus rest of the emerging markets, you couldn't tell the difference. The correlation is, uh, is more than 0.9, which basically suggests that the graphs are completely similar. That's on the stock market front. Now, now look at the economy. That India really started to first liberalize it. I think this is something which is, un, uh, which is a bit underappreciated by the general audience, that India started to first liberalize, not in 1991, but in 1981. Uh, India had a balance of payments crisis in 1981. We had a terrible 1970s, and then we had a balance of payments crisis in 1981. We went to the IMF. At that point in time, India went and took the largest loan that any country had ever taken from the IMF, and the first seeds of decontrol were sown back then. Because in, re in return for that IMF assistance, we had to do a number of things, which is about uh, cutting down on some of the import barriers, on some of the controls that we had, which were shackling the economy. And India's growth rate till then was about 3, 3.5% three on average, between 1950 to 1980. From 1980 onwards, India's growth rate jumped up to an average of about five, five and a half percent or so. So the entire decade of 1980s was the first decade of acceleration in India's economic growth rate. But the model wasn't quite sustainable because a lot of it was still dependent on the government even though we were opening up and a lot of government stimulus was put into work to get India uh, um, to grow at five, five and a half percent or so. And that is what led to the balance of payments crisis in 1991 and the second wave of reforms which took place in India. And of course, those were the really big bang reforms which took place in India and put India on a more sustainable growth track. But the interesting thing is that India's growth rate uh, accelerated from 1981 onwards. So if you look at the rankings of India, it's quite fascinating. Again, there are about 150 odd emerging markets for which we have data and the IMF puts this together. Of the 150 odd emerging markets, India's rank in growth terms, in the 1980s, was about 24 of the 180 uh, or, uh, economies in the world. 30, 35 are developed economies, 150 are emerging markets. Of the 150 emerging markets, India's growth rank in the 1980s was about 24, 25 or so. In the 1990s, India's rank was also about 24, 25 or so. Last decade, India's rank uh, amongst all emerging markets was what? 24, 25 or so. So India has consistently grown at, at a pace which is linked to other um, emerging markets. But there are two very sort of interesting points out here which I find. One, that even though we carried out these big bang reforms in 1991, there was no acceleration in India's growth rate throughout the entire 1990s that India, uh, the average growth rate of India in the 1990s was also five, five and a half percent or so, the same as the 1980s. But something changed in the year 2003. That in the year 2003, magically, India started to grow at a pace of over eight percent or so. And it sustained it, that pace for much of that decade. So the key thing is what happened in 2003? In 2003, two or three things happened together. One, that emerging markets had a pretty poor 1980s and 1990s. A lot of serial crises were there from uh, 94, it started off in Mexico, and then you had the Russian crisis, the Asian uh, like financial crisis in the late 1990s, and in the early 2000s, you had uh, the uh, crisis in Argentina, and then Brazil, Turkey. So a lot of crises happened. And then a lot of these emerging markets were basically 
catching up for the poor performance that they had put in in the past decade or so. So that's what sort of started up off the boom in 2003. It was catch up. And the second very important factor, that's the year that a lot of easy money started to flow out of US and Europe. And especially out of the US as the Fed pursued an extremely aggressive monetary policy to try and lift all these economies uh, and lift its own economy rather uh, after the TMT bubble burst. So you had a lot of easy money which was flowing out of these countries. So this combination of very easy money and the fact that you had some catch up for the poor performance of the past decade is what led to this Levitation Act where almost every emerging market benefited. For me, therefore, the breakout nations concept is how are these, which economies will do better than expectations and better than other economies in the same income class over the next three to five years or so.